Um, all right, Governor, look at the start of this year. You were a rising star in the GOP. You were neck and neck with Donald Trump, widely considered uh, the obvious and potentially the only viable primary challenger to the former president. Then you jumped in the race and the story kind of changed. Trump has gained ground. You've lost ground. Donors are starting to look elsewhere. Challengers for the Trump alternative mantle are feeling emboldened. What happened? Well, that's a narrative. I don't think that's an accurate narrative. I mean, at the end of the day, we're here on the ground uh, building the type of organization that you need in Iowa. We're doing the same thing in New Hampshire, uh, and we are getting people uh, every single day to sign up. Look, at the end of the day, in these early states, they want to see you. Uh, they know that I'm governor of Florida. They know we've done good things. People have positive view. Republican voters have positive views. But they want to know why you uh, to be the next president of the United States. And so as we deliver that message, uh, we get a good response. Uh, this stuff is something you've got to work at. Um, you know, some of these polls, uh, I've never put stock in them. And at that time, I was saying that that stuff was a lot of a mir mirage, uh, basically who was in the news at the time. Now we're getting down to nitty gritty uh, and we're going to be here and we are going to outwork everybody. It's narrative, but narrative sometimes either reflects or sometimes even becomes reality, right? I mean, look, you've got even a Fox News commentator recently saying, quote, you're going to fade out and wither and die on the vine. Your biggest donor is now saying that he may hold his cash back unless you attract new major donors and adopt a more moderate approach. A new Iowa poll does suggest that you are um, gaining some ground. The margins here are narrower than they are nationally, but still overall, Trump's lead has only only grown since you began campaigning in earnest. Like, is it possible that you're potentially just out of step with what GOP voters are looking for right now? So if I had a nickel for every naysayer I've had in my life, I'd be a very, very wealthy man. I mean, even as governor, people didn't give me a chance to get elected governor in the first place. Then when COVID and we took a stand against the orthodoxy and kept the state free, I was pilloried. People said that my career was over. First of all, I don't even, that's not how I think. I think about leadership. Mm -hmm. Even my reelection, I had people a few months before the, camp, uh, before the election saying, oh, his campaign is sputtering. He doesn't know. They don't know what they're doing. And we won the biggest Republican landslide uh, in the history of the state of so Florida for governor's So you're comfortable with race. your back against the wall? We, I, am, I would much rather be underestimated. Uh, when they underestimate you, uh, that's when we're able to strike. And, you know, I think that it's been something that when people see that you're willing to show up and work, that is not something that every candidate is willing to do. Uh, and we are doing it. We're going to earn the nomination and we're going to get the job done. You are doing it. And, and I've seen, as I've been to a lot of your campaign events, I have seen a bit of a shift as there's been a lot of talk about the sort of reboot uh, that your campaign is doing and this shift that your advisors say you're making from campaigning as an incumbent governor to an insurgent candidate. Um, Campaigning for president is very different than campaigning for governor in Florida. And I am wondering, as, as you guys are a few weeks into this, this reset now, what have you learned about what maybe hadn't been working with voters before? Well, look, I mean, I think, I think that there are a lot of similarities. I mean, the good thing about the state of Florida is it's a microcosm of the United States. You know, you want to see the Midwest. I tell people in Iowa, I'm like, normally when I want to hang out with Midwesterners, I just go to Fort Myers in January because half of the Midwest is there. Same thing, you go to Miami-Dade, that's like Latin America. You go to Palm Beach, Broward, it's like the Northeast. Northern Florida is like the, the traditional South. So that has really helped us to be able to appeal. And what's happened is when you, I can get the most rural part of Iowa, someone will have a Florida connection. They will come up to me and, and some will thank me for doing things in Florida that they've heard about. So I think in that sense, um, it's actually been good preparation. Now, the difference is, yes, they know we've done a good job. Mm -hmm. I do think it's important to fill in our bio. I think it's important to fill in the fact that I'm a young father with young kids and my wife and I take that very seriously. And I think it's important to fill in my record of actually producing results. But what you have to do is tie that into the vision uh, and what we're now uh, articulating, I think, very strongly is the country's in decline. Decline's a choice. We can make a different choice in the next 18 months. I'm running for president to reverse the decline and to get us back on track. People, Republican voters, get that, uh, and they want to see change to get us on a fundamentally different path. To, to the point of, about the engagement with voters, I mean, I, I have seen 
a difference. You know, at the outset of your campaign, it was a lot of big stages, you know, some distance between you and the voters. Now you're in the pizza ranches, you're in these diners, and you're really having some intimate conversations. And I am curious, I mean, as you start to, there are learning curves on campaigns for anybody. What are you learning as you're talking to these voters about what you might want to change or what you might want to focus on more or, or what hits people? Well, I think the thing that you notice, and, and this is no disrespect to you and your industry, but what, but what the, the media is focused on is just different than what you see on the ground. Some of the stuff about the process and the polls, I've never had anybody ask me about any of that stuff. You know, they're focused on issues that matter to them. A lot of concern about the southern border. Even in a place like New Hampshire, New England, you think that that's so far from the southern border, yet they have high overdose rates from fentanyl. It's getting in their communities. It's hurting their communities. Here in Iowa, you know, they care about that. They care about education. People care about the economy. So really, it's just the more you're down on the ground answering questions, it refocuses you on you know all the stuff day to day in the news cycle and I get people need to do that I understand but ultimately that's background noise what matters is the future of the country and being on the ground with voters reminds you of where that focus should be have you been refocused after some of the conversations that you've had do you think you've honed your message based on what you've heard from voters or have well, you I think when you when you when you do this this business you know you get up in front of folks and there are things that really sing and you see the response. There's other things that you may get a polite response for, but it may not be as much. And so, you know, it's all about kind of weaving that in. And I think what we've been able to do um, effectively, particularly on these recent travels is, you know, talk about who I am, you know, as a veteran, as a blue collar kid that had to work hard to get through school, uh, as a dad, uh, six, five and three year old, the husband to a great wife, uh, what we've done in Florida, but how that projects to the country's future, and I think Republican voters are sick uh, of people that, that overpromise and underdeliver. That's kind of the norm in politics, and what I can show a record of doing is every commitment I made, we honored, and then we overdelivered on our promises. Do you think you might be wasting time trying to win over those hardcore Trump voters? I'm and trying to win over every voter. I think that's a misconception. I mean, at the end of the day, you know, like Popeye said, I am what I am. Um, you know, I was a bold governor. Uh, as Reagan said, we govern in bold colors, not pale pastels. And I think part of the reason that I did so well in the election was because people knew where I stood uh, and they knew I was a strong leader. So, so we haven't really, I think sometimes people overanalyze what you're doing. I want every Republican voter uh, out there. When I won re-election as Florida governor, I got 97% of the Republican vote. That's a record. And in Florida, yes, we have a lot of conservative Republicans. We have some that are more traditional, some that are more liberal. Uh, I want to get all of those voters uh, because you need a cross-section of voters to be able to do well. We showed that in Florida, and, and we're going to show that here. And here's the thing I think that, that people appreciate. Regardless of your view on each of these issues, and you know, even within our party, we've got diversity of views, all these voters will acknowledge, I'm a guy that gets things done. I'm a strong leader, uh, and I will be able to deliver results. And that's very important for them. And look, there are some strategists, to, to your credit, who say the, the polling and, and the widening gap between you and the former president has less to do with anything you are or are not doing. It has more to do uh, with these indictments that do tend to boost the momentum, boost the fundraising, uh, just give the president more support. In fact, uh, one of your supporters, Congressman Massey, recently joked, he said, uh, quote, we got to find some judge in Florida that'll indict DeSantis quick <laughs> to close this indictment gap. It's a truism that anytime someone is being persecuted, uh, the camp rallies to their defense. Look, it's a joke, but the point made is, is a legitimate point there. I mean, each time he's been indicted, uh, most of his primary opponents, yourself included, have kind of rallied to his defense as well. You've made your position clear that you believe uh, the justice system is two-tiered, that it's weaponized. But when Trump is spending his arraignment day attacking you, <laughs> I mean, why not fight back and because point out the and point out the downsides of being a president who is under three, maybe four indictments? Well, two couple things. One, um, it's not really about Donald Trump because I think that if the justice system is not fair, uh, if it is weaponized, and I talk more about 
Uh, Mark Houck, who was a pro-life activist, had a SWAT team go to his house. I talk about the parents that were identified going to school board meetings in Virginia. Talk about the fact that the FBI had a memo identifying traditional Roman Catholics as potential but you know terrorists. What ends up being but, about but that, Trump. But that is ultimately why it's more important than just one former elected official. Um, second thing is, is you know, at the end of the day, um, I've been very clear about how we win the election. If the election is a referendum on Joe Biden's policies and the failures that we've seen, and we are presenting a positive vision for the future, we will win the presidency uh, and we will have a chance to turn the country around. If, on the other hand, uh, the election is not about January 20th, 2025, but January 6th, 2021, or what document was left by the toilet at Mar-a-Lago, if it's a referendum on that, we are going to lose. But and with that's Trump just in the, the race, you know with Trump in the race, that is largely what it's going to be about. And right now and you're not, not fighting against not, Joe that's, Biden, that's you're not, fighting against that's Trump. Not a, that's not a pathway for success for the Republican Party. I think a lot of our voters understand that. Uh, look, I'm, one of the reasons I, I ran for president was because I think I'm the only candidate who can win the primary, win the general, and then actually get all this stuff done. Uh, the reality is you don't want distractions. I mean, this, this is hard enough, the issues facing the country. You've got to be focused. You've got to be disciplined. You've got to go in there knowing you want to talk about slaying the administrative state. They are not going to give up power willingly. You've got to be somebody that knows how to operate. You can't be suffering under distractions. You can't have all this other uh, drama that, that's doing it. So I have made that point, and I think more and more Republican voters agree, yes, we think he's been treated poorly and unfairly, but that doesn't mean then that he's the guy you want to nominate against Joe Biden. So you recently said the election is what it is. You said all those theories that were put out did not prove to be true. So can we just put this to bed so you don't have to be asked about this a million more times? Yes or no, did Donald Trump lose the 2020 election? Whoever puts their hand on the Bible on January 20th every four years uh, is the winner. And, and I don't think the election, and I've pointed out in that same quote, and I've said this from the very beginning, uh, when they changed the rules for COVID, I think that was wrong. I think some of those changes were unconstitutional. When they do mass mail ballots, I think that's wrong. I think ballot harvesting is wrong. I think the Zuckerbucks were wrong. I think the fact that the FBI was working with Facebook and these other uh, tech companies to censor the Hunter Biden story uh, was wrong. And so I don't think it was the perfect election. I remember after a lot of the media was saying this is the most secure election in history. How could it be the most secure with those millions of mail ballots going out? On the same time, at the time after the election, they were talking about Maduro um, stealing votes on the voting machines or whatever, and none of those theories proved to be true. But here's the issue that I think is important for Republican voters to think about. Why did we have all those mail votes? Because of Trump turned the government over to Fauci. They embraced lockdowns. They did the CARES Act, which funded mail-in ballots across the country. Donald Trump signed that bill that funded the mail ballots that all the Republicans ha have been so concerned about. Uh, and also with the censorship of the Hunter Biden. That was Donald Trump's FBI that was working with that. He didn't have control over his own government. So me as the nominee, we will not let them run circles around us. If there is ballot in Florida, we ban ballot harvesting, right? I think that's what you should do. If there is ballot harvesting that's allowed in like Nevada, we are going to do it too. We're not gonna fight with one hand tied behind our backs. And so uh, I think all of those issues were very problematic. But at the, end, at the end of the day, you know, Donald Trump helped facilitate that whole set of circumstances. Okay, but respectfully, you did not clearly answer that question. And if you can't give a yes or no because, on whether or not Trump lost, then how well, can of course, you? No, of, of course he lost. Uh, Trump uh, lost the 2020 of, election. Of course, okay. uh, Joe Biden's the president. But the issue is, I think what, what people in the media and elsewhere, they wanna act like somehow this was just like the perfect election. And when you have mass ballot harvesting, Zuckerberg put hundreds of millions of dollars into nonprofits to send money to election offices and basically weaponize the election offices. That is not the way you conduct elections. And so I don't think uh, it, was a, it was a good run election, but I also think Republicans didn't fight back. You've got to fight back when that is happening and you shouldn't have provided all the money to fund the mail-in ballots.
And I, I, the reason I press on that is because you make a, a lot of arguments about the culture of losing in the Republican Party. And to be clear, you do believe that well, Donald Trump lost. Here's the thing. Lost. I mean, like, if you look at, at how independent voters broke, they broke for Biden yeah. um, against Donald Trump. I don't think there's any question. You look at the 2022 election, a lot of the candidates that he got behind, independents, even though they disapproved of Biden, they still, they still broke for the Democrats. And so I think with all those issues, with the mail ballot sucker bucks, if Trump had just won independent voters, he would have won the Electoral College. And I think in Florida, what we showed is, you know, we won independent voters by 18 percentage points. You cannot win a national election just with Republicans. Uh, you got to have appeal beyond that. Uh, and if we do that, we'll be able to win. And to your point, I do talk to a lot of voters who are frustrated with these indictments because they do distract from the issues. And in Iowa and so many other places, GOP primary voters care a lot about immigration and, and other issues. So I do want to talk to you about some of the policy plans that you've rolled out. You're sure. one of the few candidates that's been uh, very vocal and outspoken and have put out those platforms. So credit to you on that. And we can talk about that. So um, when it comes to immigration, you went down to the border, you put out a plan to secure the border where you outline some pretty severe consequences for those who come into our country illegally. Uh, you've said uh, that folks can use deadly force, that law enforcement can use deadly force, saying if cartels are trying to run product into this country, they're going to end up stone cold dead. How far might you take that method for preventing illegal crossings in general? Like under a DeSantis administration, would anyone crossing the border illegally potentially face deadly force from law it would enforcement? Be, it, no, it's similar to like if you're in the military, you have rules yeah. of engagement. Anyone that's hostile intent or a hostile act, which the cartels are, you know, you would then engage with lethal force. I think these cartels are, are basically foreign terrorist organizations. They are responsible for killing more Americans on an annual basis than any other group or country uh, throughout the entire world. And yet this is just happening, and it's happening in communities all across the United States. You can find uh, these angel mothers who've lost ki children uh, to fentanyl overdose in virtually any community in the United States. And I, it really hit me when I was down in Arizona. You know, most of the border doesn't have a wall, of course, but there was parts where there was a wall. And these guys are working on the wall. I'm like, what are you doing? They're like, we're repairing the hole. The cartels cut through yeah. the steel beams. So if you see that happening and they got the satchel of, of fentanyl uh, strapped to their back, you use deadly force against them. You lay them out you will see a change of behavior. You have to take the fight to the cartels. Otherwise, we're going to continue to see Americans dying. Well, and I spent a lot of time at the border, too, and I'm sure, as you know, it's not a monolith, right? In the Rio Grande Valley, you've got a lot of uh, families with young children crossing, whereas you go somewhere like Arizona, Cochise County, you've got a, a lot of uh, single but, men. But the cartels will use the children and they will use the families to help camouflage the illicit activity. Right. And the children... I mean, it's, it's so we, we actually are doing we have a statewide grand jury in Florida that, that's investigating all the illegal migration because we've had it come into Florida. They've actually found instances where a mother will basically rent out children to military age males, because if you come in with a minor, uh, it's better for you to do that than if you come in as a what kind of a policy is this that is incentivizing that type of behavior? So what we're going to do, we're going to stop it. We're going to put remain in Mexico back in. We are not going to accept asylum, bogus asylum claims. Right now, you come in, you do a bogus asylum claim, they give you a sheet of paper, come back in three years for a court date. How is that a disincentive to come illegally? And the thing is, is yes, there's massive drugs killing people, sex trafficking, human trafficking, horrible. You do have criminal aliens coming across. But put all of that aside, the sheer number of people Communities are overwhelmed. You can't have, even if it was legal immigration, you can't have that much, uh, that many people uh, pouring into communities. It puts stress on schools. It puts stress on health care, criminal justice, the whole nine yards. So we'll stop it. We will actually build a border wall. I mean, I think that, you know, we have good experience of getting things done in Florida, so we will do that. Uh, but I think being, being willing to lean in against the cartels is going to be the critical element. But to that point, I mean, you, you know, you yourself were uh, an advisor to Navy SEALs. You know 
how hard it is sometimes when it comes to rules of engagement, how to tell good guys from bad guys, especially when folks are crossing the border undercover of night. How, how do you well, discern not, if it's a child, a mother uh, or Obviously, a cartel you know, member? If it's a child, I mean, you're not going to do that. But I mean, they have. Right, but a pregnant mom in a baseball cap with a backpack. They have, versus, they have indications. Okay. I mean, I think it's, I mean, if you have people blow torching through a border wall, that is not going to be. That's yeah, not but as you fly. mentioned, the, bo- the wall gonna, isn't everywhere. Wall. How do you know but, you're, but you you're do using that. deadly force it's against the, same the right way you people? you would do in any situation. Same way a police officer would know. Same way uh, somebody operating in Iraq would know. You know, these people in Iraq at the time, they all looked the same. You didn't know who had a bomb strapped to them. So those guys have to make judgments. But the fact that we're going to stop the, the phony asylum claims and stop the invasion, that's going to be half of it. Because here's the thing. If people know that coming illegally is not going to be a benefit, they're not going to make that whole trek knowing that they're not going to be able to get entry. The reason why people keep coming is because they know the United States has a ridiculous policy. They're literally on an app coming illegally and signing up with our own government to get a court date. They get released in the interior of the country and then they come back. What, two, three years later? How many of them are actually going to show up? Uh, for those court dates. So once you say that that doesn't work anymore, you will see it it decline. The cartels are going to still try to move product in, uh, but that'll make it easier for us to be able to focus on them rather than having hordes of people come. And other issues that's been talked about a lot on the campaign trail, on the campaign trail by both Democrats and Republicans, abortion. Now, when it comes to your position on abortion and where you stand on any sort of national ban, you've been asked about this a lot. And I've read through a lot of your answers, listened to your interviews. And I just want to clarify, in this post-Dobbs era, do you believe that abortion is an issue that should just be dealt with on a state-by-state basis? So uh, I'm pro-life. I have a record of being uh, promoting a culture of life in Florida, just like they've done in Iowa, just like they've done in South Carolina. Dobbs returned it to the political branches. I think the reality is that that basically means the states are going to have primary control over it. You know, I do think the federal government would have an interest in, say, preventing post-birth abortions or things that are that are really horrific. But I don't think that there's enough consensus in the country uh, to see a lot of, of, of mileage in Congress. So I think what I've said is, you know, if you want to protect life, it's a bottom up movement. And so let's work with states that have done it, work in your local communities. Um, but you also have to understand, you know, what Iowa's done is not what New Hampshire is going to do. And what Wisconsin will do is not what Texas is going to do. So would you veto any sort of federal bill that tries to put a nationwide ban in place? So we will be a pro-life president and and we will support pro-life policies. Um, I would not allow uh, what a lot of the left wants to do, which is to override pro-life protections throughout the country all the way up really until the moment of birth in some instances, which I think is, is infanticide. Uh, well, actually, not- I got to push back on you on that because that that's a, a misrepresentation of, of what's happening. I mean, that 1.3 percent of abortions happen at 21 weeks or higher. There's no, no right. evidence of Democrats pushing for but, but their abortions view up is, until their view is, is that all the way up into that, that there should not be any legal protections. Uh, there is no in indication now, of Democrats right. pushing you're, you're for right. that. Well, yes, they are. They've done it in California. They've done it in other states. They uh, have not instituted some... that policy. Yeah, they have. Yeah, they have. Uh, they basically will say that, you know, if there's some type of like it, 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 they'll use like different ways to really have a, it's, have a it's wide exception It's extremely rare. 1.3 percent. And in those circumstances, they're typically extremely emotional decisions. Well, no, I mean, I, 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 I don't say that that's the norm in terms <laughs> of this, but I do think that the left in this country has moved on from a position that said, you know what, we do want to discourage abortion, it's not something that's a good thing, to now viewing it more as a positive good for society. And I think most Americans, regardless of how they feel on legal protections, I don't think most Americans think it's a positive good for society. It's obviously a tragic circumstance. The FDA just approved over-the-counter birth control. Do you support widespread access to contraception or do you think there should be some limits? No, 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 no. Uh, Contraception in Florida, we actually, our Department of Health, uh, we provide uh, about 100,000 people a year uh, with access to contraception at no cost to them. And that should be, I think it should be available over the counter. And I think people should be able to have access to it. Um, In Florida, you signed a bill that criminalizes any person, quote, who performs or actively participates in the termination of a pregnancy after six weeks. Um, In terms of enforcement or limits on abortion, to to what extent do you believe that uh, women should be punished for violating an abortion ban? Not at all. No, I don't think this is an issue about the woman. Uh, I think a lot of these women 
you know, are in very difficult circumstances. They don't get any support from a lot of the fathers. And a lot of them, the number one reason why women choose to have an abortion is because they're not getting support and they feel abandoned. Now in Florida, we've provided support and we put our money where our mouth is. Um, but at the end of the day, um, you know, I would not support any, um, any penalties on a woman. In the post-Dobbs era, one of the concurring opinions from Justice Thomas is he brought up the idea of considering issues like same-sex marriage, uh, potentially sending those uh, back to the states. Would you want to see same-sex marriage sent back to the states in the same way as abortion? Well, he was the only one that signed that opinion, and so I think that the other justices pointed out that you know, when there's a reliance interest, it's less likely that they're going to do that. So, so I don't think that that's in the cards. Um, and in Florida, even though our state had a, had a constitutional amendment when Obergefell came down, uh, we basically um, honored that, um, and that's what we'll continue to do. However, I don't think that uh, the federal government should ever be in a position or any level of government to force churches uh, to adopt different definitions of marriage than, than what they have traditionally done, uh, whether Christian or Jewish. Um, and I think that that's going to be a live issue going forward because I think people are going to be more aggressive on it. Florida's new standards for teaching African-American history cause a lot of controversy. You have made education a really big part of your platform, both as governor and as a presidential candidate. So let's just talk about your take on, on these new standards. And the one sentence that's received the most backlash, I'll just read it to you. Instruction includes how slaves develop skills, which in some instances could be applied for their personal benefit. So let's just be clear. You believe this is uh, an important topic that should be taught in schools. So that is, means they develop skills uh, in spite of slavery, not because of slavery. It was them showing resourcefulness and then using those skills uh, once slavery ended. And the people that put those standards together were scholars of African American history. This, these were not political standards. Florida eliminated critical race theory because it's ideology and we want education, not indoctrination. When we did that, a lot of people were saying, oh, you don't want to teach about African-American history, the bill actually required more robust standards. So that's how that working group came into being. So they had copious standards. I mean, just really thorough. And we're one of only 14 or 15 states that even has African-American history standards. Uh, that was written by primarily African-Americans themselves who were scholars. Um, and they've been very clear. They are not saying that slavery was a positive good at all. And if you read the entire standards, it's very clear that they're showing that this was a grave injustice and it contradicted the founding principles of our country. But, but to, to my question, I mean, you've been, you've been so involved in, in Florida education standards. I mean, do you believe no, that right. this is we, important no, well, to we, teach? We, we, we've, been, we've been involved in education, not indoctrination. Those standards were not political at all. The legislature didn't dictate any of that. Governor's office didn't dictate anything of that. These guys worked in a very professional manner. They produced those standards. There was public comment. This was all done in the public. They were being praised for what they did because of how thorough it was. And then Kamala Harris decided to come down and demagogue it and basically lie about it. And these guys who wrote it, they've defended what they've done. And so as governor, I'm gonna stand by them. I am not gonna let people lie about things that are going on in Florida. That's become a cottage industry. Uh, we have got to stop acting in bad faith in this country. There's no way you can read that whole list of standards and come to any other conclusion that they are accurately depicting the injustice of slavery, but they're also depicting the resourcefulness of people who overcame great obstacles, and not just with respect to slavery. During the American Revolution, they're actually showing the black founding fathers. A lot of people don't talk about that. Uh, and so I think that those scholars that did that, many of whom were black themselves, um, I think that they deserve to be defended on that. But do you see how some folks might find that kind of language offensive? I mean, Tim Scott, who was a fellow but, Republican, but said, what slavery was about was separating families, about, about mutilating humans, even raping their wives. It was devastating. So I would hope that every person in our country and certainly running for president would appreciate that. People have bad days, he added. Sometimes they regret what they say, and we should ask them to clarify their positions. Don't take the side of Kamala Harris uh, against the state of Florida. Don't indulge uh, those lies. Those well, are, what, those are what, not is Ka true. what is Kamala Harris lying about? She's saying that those standards that were developed by African-American history scholars are somehow saying slavery was a good thing. That's false. That is not what they said. That is not what those standards said. Uh, and incidentally, she endorsed an advanced placement African-American history course 
that had the same exact provision in it uh, just a few months ago, and somehow that was an issue. Their it's scholars, actually... hold on, their scholars affiliated with the Liberal 1619 Project, who have identified uh, similar situations. Uh, and, and I think what our uh, the head of our working group, who was the former chairman of the U.S. Civil Rights Commission, you know, he's pointed out people like Booker T. Washington uh, and how they conceived of their life's journey. So it is not in any way, um, you know, saying anything positive about the institution. It is. Um, uh, the, the standards as a whole are clearly showing, you know, what it is. And so we've got to get beyond uh, demagoguing people. We've got to get beyond uh, the lies on all this stuff. We are doing education. Uh, we've put people in place to develop a very strong set of standards that most states are not teaching any of this stuff. We've made African-American history a priority, and we're going to continue to do that. But we are going to speak the truth, and we're going to fight back. I mean, it's wrong. If, if, if this was a different state and, and, and the governor wasn't running for president, no one would have said anything about that. They're trying to whip it up. Uh, just to be able to launch political attacks against me. But I take offense because the, these people worked really hard on it. They were not doing anything um, out of the ordinary. Well, I think you're right. If you weren't running for office, this wouldn't be in the spotlight. But you've also put education uh, in, in the spotlight, rightfully so, because it's an important issue. But, but to your point that uh, there are similar standards in the, in the AP African American Studies course, uh, I, I looked at both. I, I read your standards and I, and I, and I read those as well. The, the line that you're talking about, it says, in some areas there were distinct roles separating domestic and agricultural laborers, although enslaved persons could be, uh, or I'm sorry, it's um, in addition to agricultural work, enslaved people learned specialized skills, uh, trades, and worked as painters, carpenters, tailors, musicians, healers in North and the South. Once free, African Americans use these skills to provide for themselves and others. I think that issue people take with is the word benefit and the overall framing of the Florida standards where, you know, looking at the AP course versus yours, the word enslaver appears dozens of times in the AP course. It doesn't appear once in, in your standards. And, and the criticism that I've seen beyond just that one sentence is the, the, the general framing of a, a slightly more positive light. No, that's not true. I mean, there, there's all the, the gory details are in all of those standards. And in fact, you know, since I've been governor, we've added to what type of African American history has been taught. For example, we did the, we, we have mandatory instruction on the election day riots, the Ocoee election day riots in 1920. Um, when I became governor, one of my first acts of office was to pardon the Groveland Four. And the reason why we did that is because they got railroaded uh, through a, an unjust legal system. And so we've recognized this uh, throughout all of Florida history and American history, and there's not been any ambiguity about it. This is all just about you know, trying to create a phony narrative, uh, going after a political opponent, um, and, and trying to create demagoguery and fake narratives. But we got to get beyond that, and we got to focus on you know, what's best for, for, for students and what's best for parents. You know, we believe protecting parents' rights, letting them direct the education, and we believe the education in the school should just simply be factual and it shouldn't have a political agenda. At the end of the day, the reason why they're coming after this is because we did take the critical race theory out. Um, you know, we're not going to let people shoehorn uh, history into a modern-day political agenda. Yeah, you've also talked about, and, and one of your bills includes making sure that uh, folks aren't made to feel uncomfortable or guilty of, when it comes to their race when, when they're talking. Well, that's critical issues. race there. I mean, you literally will have situations where if uh, these are like young kids, six-year-old kid happens to be white, they're an oppressor. Six-year-old kid happens to be African American. That's there somehow oppressed. That's a horrible well, message to send to people. What if it's older children, middle school, high school, you know, seventeen-year-olds? To categorize olds. people and to scapegoat them based on things that may have happened 100, 200 years ago is wrong. It is not going to help this country come together. What I think we have to do as a country is focus on the things that unite us. And let's de-emphasize some of the things that divide us. That is how I thought most people used to think uh, was the aspiration. Now, things like critical race theory, what they're doing is they are trying to emphasize the things that divide, even if superficial, and they're de-emphasizing the things that unite us. We should be united that the founding principles of this country are our guiding light. The great things about American history are when people stood up and achieved recognition of that. 
throughout history, whether it was after the Civil War and the 13th Amendment, whether it was the civil rights in the 60s and a whole host of other things you know, that have happened, but those ideals were what drove all those advancement. So let's not say that somehow those are, are not uh, uh, great ideals. That is what we should be united behind and say no matter where you come from, no matter what you look like, you should have an opportunity to succeed in America. But I don't want to divvy up people uh, in the classroom uh, based on their skin color. That is a dead end for this country. Let's talk about them. Um, I just want to ask about Gavin Newsom real quick, that debate. All right, one more. Uh, yeah. Um, you're uh, about, to, you said yes to debating uh, Governor Gavin Newsom. Uh, you're debating someone who isn't even in the race. Some are saying this is more like an underguard debate for 2028. Why are no, you doing no, no, this? No, no, well, no. Well, I think a couple things. I mean, I think that, you know, the debate between Florida and California, I mean, that debate has already been had in the sense that people have left California. People have come to Florida. They voted with their feet over these since both of us have become governor. And I don't think California ever lost population until he became governor. But looking forward for the country's future, I think this is a very much the live debate about do you want the California model or do you want the Florida model? Biden basically would like to Californicate the United States. Biden also may not be the nominee. You could have Kamala from California. You could have Newsom. You he's, think it could be Newsom? He's waiting in the wings. I think a lot of people are waiting in the wings. I don't know what they're going to do in that, in that party. Would you want it to be Newsom? But the, but the, you know, bring, bring on whoever they want to do. I mean, I think it would be a good debate. So, you know, Sean um, Hannity had asked him. And then they came to me, and I'm like, yeah, yeah, we'll do it. I think it'll be good, good for the country to have the, the differences of opinion. Very different approach to crime, very different approach to illegal immigration, very different approach to taxes, government regulation, uh, all these different things that uh, I think would be a good benefit. So, so I'm, I said I'm game to do it. Hopefully they'll be able to get it scheduled, and we'll make it happen. All right, well, we'll get ready to watch. Yeah. <laughs> Thank, Thank you, you, Governor. Appreciate really it. appreciate it. Of course. It. Yeah. Thank you so much. Thanks for watching our YouTube channel. Follow today's top stories and breaking news by downloading the NBC News app.